Hey, I'm Chris Roth, the professional prospector. and Today we're going to be talking about lithium, the battery metal. Now, lithium is something that probably if you're an older guy like me, hell, you never heard of that before, but it's become super important because of the green technologies of making things electric and making things more environmentally friendly. And so lithium has become incredibly important for the lithium battery. Now lithium has been known for a long time. It was discovered way back in like the early 1800s and a scientist estimate for the amount of lithium in the crust of the earth is around 20 to 70 parts per million, making it about the most, uh, making it the 25th most abundant element in the Earth's crust. Now, lithium is a soft, silvery, white metal. It's so soft that you can cut it with a knife like butter, okay? And it, it, it has the lowest density of any metal. It reacts vigorously with water, generating flammable hydrogen. It has a variety of different uses that it's been used for uh, and continues to be used for, but by far the most important use is the lithium ion battery that's rechargeable. These rechargeable batteries are used for all sorts of things from laptops to cell phones, uh, digital cameras like the camera I'm filming this on, and all sorts of other things that use a battery. Lithium is used in some non-rechargeable batteries for things like pacemakers and for uh, toys and clocks and stuff like that. Because lithium is so light, it's used as an alloy with things like aluminum and magnesium that improve the strength and lightness characteristics of both the aluminum and the magnesium for all kinds of different uses where you want a light, strong alloy. These light alloys are used in things like aircraft, of course, bicycle frames, high-speed trains, and other things, like I say, where you need something really light and strong. Lithium oxide is used in special kinds of glasses and glass ceramics. Lithium uh, has had a huge increase, though, in usage in the last 10, 15 years mostly due to the rechargeable lithium-ion battery. Only a few miles to the east of here is a factory, the Tesla Gigafactory, where they crank out thousands upon thousands of lithium batteries every day. The batteries are, they're used not just for Tesla cars, they are they're making batteries that go into other uses, but a lot of them go into making Tesla cars and to make the batteries for a Tesla car, they take these small, uh, lithium ion batteries and put them into arrays that look like this. So this is what the array looks like. Each one of these little cells is a battery and they're assembled into an array like this and then put in a box to protect them and then a number of boxes like this go into the power system of the car because each one of these has so many there are literally a few thousand little cells like this in every car. Now countries around the world are looking for green agenda type things and, and a big part of these uh, green agendas are, is the move to electric and hybrid type automotive vehicles and these vehicles use a lot of lithium. Now the average electric car uses about 22 pounds or about 10 kilos of lithium. The Tesla however uses even a lot more than that. And usually these batteries are located uh, on the bottom of the car, right under the seats. Now you may think, hey, Chris just said that lithium is flammable and highly reactive. And of course, the electric cars have a reputation for bursting into flames when they're, uh, when they're in an accident. Take a look at this. You can see here that it's not without reason that electric cars have a well-earned reputation for catching fire. But you might also say to yourself, hmm, I'm not thinking that putting those batteries that are flammable and reactive right under my seat is a good idea. Well, it, what all can I tell you is that one thing is that if you're in an accident and your batteries catch fire and it's burning super hot, you'll know about it right away. Roughly 2 million electric vehicles were sold in 2019, but it's expected that the sales of these vehicles 
will be up to 30 million electric vehicles per year by 2027, only about six years from now. The idea of green power and uh, renewable electrical sources also promotes the idea of using more lithium batteries for storage of things like, you know, if you have wind power, well, you need to be able to store it sometimes for when the wind isn't blowing or solar power, of course, to store it when the sun isn't shining. Now, Tesla, actually part of their uh, batteries that are made in, in the factory uh, not far from here, are used in uh, what they call a power wall and it's a, a home device for battery storage lithium battery storage so you could have solar uh, panels on your roof and store the electricity and be able to use it at night in 2019 uh, rechargeable batteries accounted for about 54 percent of the total lithium demand almost entirely for lithium ion batteries the rapid rise of hybrid and electric vehicles has greatly increased the demand for these compounds. A few years back, it was seen that the demand for lithium and lithium batteries was growing so fast that the mines and suppliers of lithium weren't going to be able to meet the demand for lithium compounds coming from the mines. And so they, the price of lithium started to shoot up because people realized, hey, there's not enough lithium to meet what we need it for. Now, like I say, because demand was exceeding supply, prices shot way up. And between 2015 and 2018, the price for lithium on the market actually tripled. And this spurred a whole lot of exploration and search for lithium deposits and new lithium mines because it was just realized and recognized that the existing lithium mines weren't going to be able to meet the need. The search found a lot of lithium and it sparked the opening of new lithium mines all across the planet. Thousands of mining claims were staked all over, especially in the western US and in fact in my home state of Nevada, like nearly every dry lake bed in the whole state, and there's a lot of dry lake beds in Nevada, nearly every dry lake bed in the entire state was staked with mining claims. And you know, some people made a good amount of money off that. They sold those claims to mining companies who wanted to explore for lithium. And uh, you know, some people made some good money doing that. The only active lithium mine in the US is actually at Clayton Valley in kind of the west central part of Nevada. And uh, here's a picture of it. This is the only lithium mine currently operating in the United States. They basically take brine waters from below the surface, pump them onto the surface and evaporate them. We'll talk more about this later in the video. However, by the middle of 2018, things had changed. The boom had resulted in new production, just like the market does. You know, you, you have high prices and high demand and people rush out to meet the supply. And sure enough, by mid 2018, prices peaked and started going down. Lithium uh, hydroxide and carbonate prices continued to display a downward trend through 2018, through the majority of 2019, uh, with monthly uh, lithium prices falling 36% between January and December of 2019. It continued down in 2020, and uh, prices have uh, continued to fall until they stabilized around $7,000 a ton. Lithium is not sold by the ounce or the pound. It's, it's usually sold by the ton. $7,000 a ton means, uh, or a US ton, means that the price for the lithium compounds is about $350 a pound. And yet, even as the prices have dropped and there's been so much more lithium on the market, there still is the same strong forecast for growth for demand in the coming years that there was five, six years ago. Now with prices low but stabilized, uh, a lot of lithium miners have taken steps to survive a challenging market with conditions, uh, you know, they scale back production and uh, do what they can to cut costs. But a lithium industry expert recently said that I expect better market conditions in lithium because the EU and uh, Great Britain have legislated to change cars from internal combustion engines to electric and with a new administration here in the US, you're gonna see more of the same kind of thing trying to force the market to go more to electric and hybrid than to internal combustion engines. And in fact, just the other day, uh, 
Ford and I think uh, GM announced that they would be switching eventually, not in the near term, but in the uh, next uh, 15 years or so to basically all electric vehicle production. Falling car sales in 2020 you, due to the, uh, the virus pandemic, uh, cost of the car makers sales um, because people just weren't out and about as much and you know they, if you're not driving your car you don't need a new car. Still the longer term scenario is for increased uh, electric vehicle production and increased demand for lithium ion batteries. Now lithium ion batteries last a long time. Uh, they're, they're good for a number of years, but they don't last forever. Nothing does. And one of the things that you notice on uh, lithium batteries, if you have any, is a picture like this. Nearly all lithium ion batteries will have a little picture on it like you see on the right side of this battery that says don't throw it in the trash, be sure to recycle. And so telling you to recycle, you know, that's a good idea, but I'm going to tell you the truth about lithium battery recycling in that's that no one recycles lithium batteries. You aren't supposed to throw them in the trash, you're supposed to recycle them, but there's no one out there that actually does lithium battery recycling. Right now, the uh, substandard, uh, don't meet spec batteries, off spec batteries from the Tesla Gigafactory that I've mentioned uh, go to a research and development company also not far from here. And they're continuing to work on ideas of ways to extract the metals from these, you know, from, from the, the batteries that are substandard. And in the future, maybe from batteries that are collected as waste. But, uh, you know, they're still working on the technology. It's difficult because these batteries are a mixture of different metals and it's hard to separate them out. Uh, one of the things that's expected to drive future recycling of lithium batteries is the nickel and cobalt that's in the batteries. And because those metals actually are much more valuable per pound than lithium. But of course, if you're chemically processing the batteries and recycling the metals and getting the nickel and cobalt, you'll also want to get the valuable lithium out of it just as well. So someday in the future, there probably will be lithium battery recycling. But for now, there's nobody that's doing lithium battery recycling other than just kind of research and development scale testing to try and figure out how they can do it economically. So right now, the battery tells you to recycle. Yeah, you really can't do that. But someday, someday there'll be lithium battery recycling. I just don't know when and really neither does anybody else. Okay, so let's talk about the geology, the minerals, and the, the valuable deposits of lithium. All right, now in keeping with its name, lithium forms, lith is uh, Greek for rock. Lithium forms a small part of a lot of different igneous rocks with the largest percentage being in the lighter end, uh, the granitic and rhyolitic uh, end of the spectrum. Granitic pegmatites uh, have a great abundance sometimes of lithium minerals, uh, including the most important of these lithium minerals are spodumene and petalite, which are two lithium silicates. And then also important is uh, lipidolite, which is a lithium mica. So let's take a look at some of these lithium minerals right now. We'll examine them and do a little survey here. This is the mineral spodumene. It doesn't really look like much. It's a lithium aluminum silicate, but it's an important source of lithium. This is also spodumene, but with a little bit of translucency and a little color. Removal of the lithium from spodumene is quite a task. It's a lithium aluminum silicate and takes a lot of effort to extract the lithium from this mineral. Now if the crystals of spodumene are clear enough and perfect enough, it can be a beautiful gemstone. This is actually spodumene also, but this beautiful crystal is worth far more than the lithium contents it contains. This thing was big. When I took this picture a few years ago, I remember this being several pounds in size. This is petalite, another but less common lithium aluminum silicate that's found with spodumene. It also is hard to remove the lithium from. This is lipidolite, a lithium mica mineral. You can see by the shiny scales it looks like a mica. 
Uh, now the scales on this specimen are large. That's why it's a mineral specimen. It's attractive looking. This is also lipidolite. Now it's not the pink uh, rod shaped crystals. That's actually tourmaline. It's the lighter colored material that makes up the body of the rock. There's a mine in San Diego County, California that produced many tons of material exactly like this and a hundred plus years ago it was a large source of lithium for the world's needs. A newer source for lithium is the clay mineral hectorite which uh, I'll, let me show you a picture here. Here's some of that clay the miners are taking samples of it to test for further work to extract the lithium but as you can see the clay doesn't look particularly unusual it's just that it tests for lithium content. Lithium and its compounds were historically extracted from hard rock pegmatites like the spodumene and lipidolite and that sort of thing. But uh, beginning in the, uh, the 1980s and into the 1990s, um, the brine deposits started to be more important. It turns out that a lot of dry lake beds that have uh, salty water uh, not far below the surface, sometimes on the surface when the season is wet, uh, the brines that are in that water uh, contain a significant amount of lithium. Most of the brine deposits are in Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, but hey, here in Nevada we've had a brine producer of lithium in the Clayton Valley for a number of years. However, with the increasing prices in lithium on the market, uh, the spodumene and, and pegmatite based deposits are becoming more and more important and Australia has started up some lithium production and by 2020 Australia had become the, the world's largest producer of lithium mostly based on its spodumene deposits. Let's look at the geology of lithium deposits. Lithium is mainly recovered from three different types of deposits. They are the lithium brines that I mentioned in dry lake beds, desert lake beds, the uh, pegmatite base, spodumene and petalite and lipidolite, those are another one. And then a new one is kind of the sedimentary type. This is the clay deposits that I mentioned. And there's some significant uh, deposits of lithium in clays. Now, pegmatite is a coarse grained intrusive igneous rock that forms when the magma comes up near the surface enough to cool enough to solidify, but not that it comes onto the surface like lava, but just that it's near the surface up to where it has a chance to the melt cools and slowly crystallizes. This gives rise to rocks like granite, okay? And what happens is as that stuff slowly cools and the crystals of quartz and mica and felspar and whatever grow in that solid rock, there's a, a certain types of elements that just don't fit in well into the structure of felspars and micas and similar types of minerals. And because they don't fit in, when the other minerals solidify, they're still in the melt, and, and this includes water. There's also a steam that's in there under high pressure. It's still a liquid water. And, and so these minerals are in a watery brine, and uh, lithium is one of these. But rare earths and, and boron and some other things are beryllium also find their way into this concentration. As that last little bit cools off, it has a chance to cool off very slowly and it has lots of water, so very large crystals grow. And this is the origin of the pegmatite-based lithium. Now, it also produces beautiful crystals for collectors and gemstones and a lot of other things, but they tend to be in zoned bodies even within this pegmatite structure. Take a look at this zoning diagram from the Stuart Lithium Mine, once an important lithium producer uh, more than 100 years ago uh, from northern San Diego County in California. This diagram shows a lithium rich pegmatite dike in Southern California in the Pala area. And you can see from the diagram that even within a pegmatite, it has distinct layers of its own 
that are productive of different things. Now you can see on this diagram the white blade or rod-like uh, material that's spodumene and then the dark material in between the blades is petalite another lithium mineral and then the layer of lavender colored material below that with little spots of pink or dark pink uh, lines in it uh, that is the lipidolite in this zone and then above that you can see a lot of writing and drawing in a light pink layer is where the gem pockets were located so this dike was productive not only of just lithium but gem minerals as well there are important resources of pegmatite based lithium deposits in australia the u.s canada ireland uh, finland and the democratic republic of the congo all of these are known to be significant pegmatite based lithium deposits um, but the world's largest and the biggest producer is a deposit called green bushes the green bushes mine in australia and it has a grade of ore where the ore contains 2.4 percent lithium now a kind of a new deposit that people are just getting into is the sedimentary type and these are the clay deposits that i've talked about a little bit Roughly about 8% of the known global resources for lithium are found in these clay deposits and uh, they're kind of new and, and the amount that, that's being found increases as time goes by. There are various clay minerals that the lithium is found attached with or associated with. Uh, the most common one is a mineral called hectorite and it's named after a place in Hector, California, where the clay there has about seven tenths of a percent lithium. Many companies are researching and developing the best methods for this, for extracting the lithium from the clay. It isn't uh, that really hard, but it uh, is taking some research. There's uh, a company uh, called Rio Tinto. It's a big, big mining company that's got a mine that's been being worked for boron for almost a hundred years and they're looking at taking their waste clay tailings from the mining of boron and removing the lithium from them. They've known that this clay has some lithium in it for a lot of years. Got a hundred years worth of mining tailings to process for lithium. They could become one of the biggest lithium producers in the United States. There's also a, a kind of an evaporative lacustrine, uh, they call it lake related evaporites that are found uh, and it's not well understood but it's an association of lithium and boron kind of like the one that they were mining that they're mining there in california and in uh, recent years they found a large deposit of this in serbia and there's a large deposit called rhyolite ridge in nevada that's not very far from the existing clayton valley lithium mines that's also a, a large area of material that has minerals with uh, lithium and boron that contain uh, valuable deposits. Finally, the kind of one of the biggest and uh, largest reserves is the lithium brine deposits. These are these continental dry lakes where stuff drains into the lake and, and it's in a desert um, and it evaporates. It's not really a, a lake, but usually below the surface there are salty waters remaining because the surface water evaporates, but the stuff below the surface just continues to get more and more briny and salty. So these reserves of underground salty water contain significant lithium and they can be processed and the lithium removed. What happens is they take this material and they pump it up to the surface and they let it dry and dry and dry and eventually what happens is the salt and other minerals crystallize out but the lithium stays in the liquid and eventually when the material gets salty enough they can pump the liquid and extract the lithium from it the intersection of the countries of chile bolivia and argentina make up a region that's known as the lithium triangle it's a high desert area uh, near the Andes Mountains that uh, you know is very dry and has a number of these really large dry lakes or salars as they're known. Chile is a leading producer of lithium followed by Argentina. So let's talk about prospecting for lithium. As I mentioned when prices were real high a few years ago people were really putting a lot of work into prospecting for lithium and a lot of interesting lithium deposits were found even here in Nevada. 
And so we're going to talk about the best ways to prospect for lithium, what kind of deposits there are. So let me show you a map of the world deposits of lithium. Here's a map of known world resources. The green dots represent resources that are from brine type sources. The brown dots represent resources for lithium that are of pegmatite origin. And then the dark gray dot represent lithium resources that are of clay, claystone type origin. So if you went out prospecting for lithium, one of the things you might prospect for is the pegmatite bodies that we've talked about. There's pegmatites that have produced lithium in the Carolinas, in South Dakota, in San Diego County, in California. And there are other pegmatites in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere that have important amounts of lithium minerals in them. The pegmatite deposits tend to occur in belts or, or districts or, or areas that are rich in pegmatite. The one in San Diego County, there's a number of pegmatite bodies that are famed for producing lithium and gemstones. In uh, South Dakota, there's a number of mines, including uh, the Etta mine that has produced quite a bit of lithium. And in South Carolina, they're actually gearing up to maybe produce lithium from a rather large spodumene belt that uh, straddles the Carolinas, uh, the state lines. Now you might be able to acquire lithium pegmatite uh, claims, but these are things that have been known about for a long time. So it's not really any kind of a secret. Now the sedimentary types that we talked about, the clay types, these I think represent a better opportunity for prospectors. These types are fairly new. They're still being recognized and new ones are being found. And uh, I think there's no doubt that there's more types of these that are yet to be discovered. But it's important to understand that this just isn't any kind of clay deposit, just any random, because there's lots and lots of clay out there. Now these are special clays and they occur in the same kind of environments that the dry lake beds occur in, that we talked about the brines, uh, the same kind of desert, dry lake, arid, uh, you know, it's these kinds of environments that produce the lithium bearing clays. I mentioned Boron, I mentioned Hector in California and Rhyolite Ridge and some other places in Nevada. These are all the same kinds of environments that might produce the lithium lake bed, dry lake bed brines. Now these playas and brines, you know, there's places that have this in uh, Nevada and Arizona and of course California. And uh, these desert dry lakes, they do have potential that the brines below the surface may have significant lithium in them, but a lot of them have been explored. So I don't think these are quite as good an opportunity for the prospector. Now there's some other types, and uh, I mentioned in my last video, a place called Round Top in, in Texas, in Western Texas, that is a, a rhyolite dome that they've found significant amounts of rare earth lithium and beryllium that they're going to be able to mine profitably from this and they're working on how to do that. I think these types of unusual lithium deposits represent the greatest opportunity for prospectors. So the clay, unusual types like these uh, rhyolite domes and some of these other things are the best opportunities for prospectors. So there you have it, that's all about lithium, where best places to prospect for it are, in the west, in the deserts, um, probably represent the best opportunity. Um, next week, we're gonna be digging into uranium, radioactive, and we're gonna take a look at, at uranium, where it comes from, uranium minerals, geology, deposits of uranium, and where you might prospect if you wanna go prospecting for uranium. Now, most of my videos though, and we will get back to this, are about prospecting for gold. And prospecting for gold is a skill, there's a lot to it. I do a lot of adventure videos about finding gold, but I talk about you know, how to recognize ores and prospect for gold. Now, if you wanna gain the skill of being able to go out in the field and look at a place and decide where the gold is and be able to dig gold in the ground in a gold-bearing deposit, well, it's a skill just like being a an electrician or a plumber, or a butcher, whatever, it's a skill that you learn how to do that. And so to teach you how to do that, I wrote a book about it called Fistful of Gold, and it has all the skills that you need, all the information you need, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my book right now. 
So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold, and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Fistful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed, and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon, and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below. But there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe and hit the uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos and you know like it and share it if again you, you see stuff that you really are excited about and I'll be coming out with lots more new videos and so we'll see you again real soon.